Afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. We'll get started in just a moment. If you could mute yourself. Certainly. And if you're not a speaker, it might be easier if you also turn off your video. And we'll give it just about another 30 seconds and then we'll get started. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this event, a conversation with Elliot Haspel. I'm Joe Waters. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Capita. Capita is an ideas lab working at the intersections of research, policy, social innovation, design, and the arts to ensure a future in which all children and families flourish. And we're very excited to be able to offer this conversation with Elliot today, not least because Elliot has become a good friend of Capita, uh, in the last uh, several months. He's written for us a number of times and we were very excited to uh, see the release of his book, Crawling Behind. So thank you and welcome. Uh, just uh, three notes here. Please remember to mute your audio and turn off your video. Also, please note that we will be recording this conversation today so that others who are not able to join us will be able to view it. And then we also invite you to type your comments or questions in the chat box. Uh, and also you can use the hashtag crawling behind on social media. We will be live tweeting the event and um, we can also source questions from either the chat box or from social media. And now I'm gonna turn it over to our uh, host, so to speak this afternoon. Uh, Katie Alberts is the Public Policy Coordinator for the New York Association for the Education of Young Children, and she will be leading our dialogue with Elliot this afternoon. Katie? So thank you for having me today. Um, Elliot, thank you for a terrific and wonderful book. Thank you. <laughs> um, really thought-provoking. Um, so just to kind of get to the central thesis to provide everybody the context that they'll need. Um, the central thesis to the book is the idea that childcare should be free for all families. So on one hand, this is a dramatic departure from the current reality, but it also does differ from recommendations such as that of the National Academies, where you would see that um, families would pay no more than 7% of their annual salary on childcare. So what makes you, dis or what made you come to the conclusion that it's essential for childcare, not just to be at a 7% cap, but to be free for all families? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Katie and Joe, for, for hosting this, and thank you all for, for being on. So fundamentally, the difference between something that is a public assistance program and something that's a public good, it changes the entire way that we approach these issues as a society. And so then what I sort of think with this whole 7% idea, which is certainly, as you say, a huge advantage or a huge advance from where we currently are, is it still keeps child care in the realm of being a public assistance program. My concern is that we're gonna constantly be fighting for dollars. We're not gonna get adequate funding to be able to pay teachers or what they should pay. Crying will fix. Daddy. <laughs> um, I, that's, that's a very familiar sound to me. Um, and <laughs> um, and uh, that we're gonna be able to, uh, yeah, then the political support isn't going to be there. On the other hand, if you look at something like K-12 public education, and I'm clear, I don't think that early childhood should be a, an exact mirror of it, but the way that we conceive it philosophically should be a mirror. 
um, you know, it's enshrined in state constitutions. Uh, there is literally a, a right to it in all 50 states. It is free for everyone, whether you have the least means or whether you're Jeff Bezos. And that's the entire reason the system works, right? And, and you know, for all of the, the flaws that the American public education system certainly has, it is freely accessible for everyone. Um, there's no shortage of slots and, and teachers while certainly underpaid or at least paid a living wage with some benefits and, and so we sort of have a baseline floor there which we does not, not exist in the early childhood years and I think the, the sort of going to anything above completely free universally for everyone it sort of gives the game away a little bit because it lets uh, everyone from politicians to electeds uh, sort of make these kind of partial measures um, without having to embrace the, the idea of it being a, a right or entitlement. Right. Um, so there's, there's a lot of approaches that you could possibly have taken to get to this, um, get to universally free childcare zero to five. Um, you have kind of landed on a child development uh, child development credit of $15,000 per child. So what what other um, policies did you look at and how did you come to decide that this was the best approach in your opinion? Yeah, definitely. And I think a couple of contextual pieces for those who haven't written the book, read the book yet. Um, first, when I talk about a credit, this has been a a point of a little bit of confusion for people in the policy world. I'm not talking about tax credit. I'm literally talking about cash direct assistance where you're handing essentially a line of credit to, to families. Right. Um, and second, I'm also very clear in the book that I don't want to get so caught up on the sort of details of plan A versus plan B that we sort of lose the, the forest for the trees in the sense that it, one way or another, we need a universally free system and it might look different in different places. Um, it might look like a hybrid in different places. Um, where I land on this is there are a couple of things about early childhood that I think are unique, particularly in a country as vast and diverse in all senses as America. Um, one is that parents need flexibility. We know that nearly one in 10 parents need not care during non-traditional hours. Um, we know that we have parents that want to work in some cases part-time, in some cases uh, we've got rural areas, we've got urban areas. And so this idea of a one-size-fits-all solution doesn't seem to make uh, sort of a ton of sense to me, which is sort of what led me more towards the idea of let's hand the actual purchasing power to parents. Um, the other thing that we know about early childhood as opposed to middle childhood adolescence is that the setting in which the care is delivered matters vastly less than the quality of that care. Um, and so there, there really is no particular inherent reason why a home-based care, parental care, care from a grandmother um, is going to be, should be uh, sort of disadvantaged versus uh, having a more sort of formal center center based setting, and so uh, part of also giving uh, the the money directly to parents so that they can zero out their child care costs while still ensuring that they 're accessing a quality program um, is to ensure that that diversity of setting um, I think politically that makes it much more viable because I saw this thing recently on Twitter where like let 's leave paternalism to the parents, um, which you know I, it, it's true right we, we, there's no we want parents as much as is practicable to, to maintain the ability to choose the care situation that is best for their specific family situation. And the more that we can empower them to make those choices, um, the better. We do, of course, need to be careful around information asymmetry. We need to be careful around bad actors. And so that's where I also talk about, I think there needs to be mandatory enrollment in a quality rating system for any providers can accept these credits. I think there needs to be um, oversight regulation, all of those quality guardrails um, but but fundamentally that's sort of where I land and 15,000 is sort of a baseline um, it's, it's sort of a come an amalgamation of a few different cost modeling uh, systems that are out there uh, and it's also a baseline so you know I think the Center for American Progress cost modeling has the, the true cost of care if you give every teacher in a center sort of a bachelor's degree is, is much closer to, to between 20 and 30,000 and I think you could certainly make an argument that for large group care um, you're gonna want to boost that up a baseline I think you can certainly make the argument that for serving children that may have extra needs, you're going to want to boost that up from a baseline. So I was just trying to find a number that was, uh, in my think, one that people could sort of wrap their minds around and also one that, that just set sort of a, a, a moderate baseline between all the different uh, sort of types of settings and needs that you might have. 
Yeah, that was something that I had to keep reminding myself, and I think you do a good job of reminding the reader in your book, is that, okay, 15,000 is not the make or break number, it's just the number we're using for the sake of starting this conversation, you yeah. know? Because um, <laughs> I was just thinking in New York, for example, a family child care provider can only care for two children under two as one person. So that's, of course, going to require something different than, say, you know, uh, a parent who's getting paid to stay at home with their one child, you know, what, what does that look like? But getting bogged down in the details is much less important, I think, than just the idea that we all need to start from a base point of free universal childcare, according to the argument of the book and I, my view as well. Um, so just pivoting a little bit to um, Capita's report, Foundations for Flourishing Futures. Um, so one of, the, one of the core components is about care and it asks us to think about how we can set up systems and structures that represent the true value of caregiving. And I think you do this in a number of ways in your book. Um, but I think one really important piece of that is the piece about paying stay-at-home parents. Um, so I had had the People's Policy Project, a lot of people might be familiar with on this call, their proposal for stay-at-home parents was paying them a quarter of the rate that you would pay a child care provider given that a child care provider still earns a poverty wage. And that was a really um, big struggle for me personally because <laughs> I can't take that as a given as someone who, who was a toddler teacher. And I think that your argument of just a baseline, a baseline credit where you know, it's allocated, um, Sorry, a little, the little pop-up really distracted me. <laughs> Where you know a, a, a parent that is a single or a single parent still has the option to stay home with their child, or a, a parent is given a living wage as the provider of childcare for their own child. I think that's really compelling. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think bringing stay-at-home parents into this is, I think, critical, both sort of, I would argue there's a, a political imperative and a moral imperative to it. Um, I think the moral imperative is that for far, far, far too long, and I say this with full knowledge that I'm saying this from the perspective of male, the women have been asked to provide domestic labor for no money, um, and that is still in large expectations. And so um, this idea that we truly want to recognize uh, both the, the critically important work that's being done when you're cultivating the next generation, literally the brains of the next generation, when you're staying home um, with a child. And, and second, um, that we want parental care to be as high quality as possible. And obviously, when we're talking quality and parental care, it's not the same thing as when we're talking, you know, with a, a you know, toddler teacher. But on some level, we don't, it is because we don't want parents stressed out. We want parents to be able to have the headspace to access resources. Um, we want you know parents to be able to have all of the the suite of supports that they need to be able to provide the best possible care to their their kid. And as a, a father, you know who has stayed home with my my children some, and who certainly has you know I know that this is not always not always it's not an easy job. And so and it is a job, even if it's one that we do out of love. And and you know so I think part that's sort of the the kind of moral argument for why we should be paying stay at home parents. I think the political one is a third of families still have a stay-at-home parent primarily providing that care. And, and while I think all of us in this sort of early childhood field are apt to use the, the statistic that two-thirds of parents have all of their, all well, two-thirds of kids have all of their parents in the workforce, and that's totally true and a great reason why we need strong external care. We can't just leave 33% um, of families kind of to the side if you're trying to build a coalition, particularly when we know that um, those parents tend to be disproportionately located in more rural areas, in areas that might lean more uh, conservative and that it's important anytime you want to build that kind of a coalition. So um, I really do think, and then you know, the point of the Capita report is caregiving is going to start to, it's already starting to change. It's going to continue to change as the, the gig economy doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Um, you know, with family structures that are shifting. Again, it goes back to that flexibility um, that we want to be able to provide parents. And so we provide them with essentially a, a sort of splittable, paratable uh, sort of line of credit that they can use as a self-pay um, when they're the ones primarily taking the care. We're, we're honoring that, that choice. We're providing this sort of flexibility to navigate the fact that we're in an economy that is uh, forcing some, some difficult like work-life conditions, and, and we want to do what we can to ensure that those families are thriving. Because I can always come back to it. When a family is thriving, the children are generally thriving. And if we can sort of center on that as an axiom, I think we, we start to build a very different looking system than the one that we have now. 
Yeah, I think, and I think that um, that ties in really well to the idea of intergeneral, intergenerational relationships and the, the most common type of care outside the home or outside of parents is um, grandparents and grandparents mm -hmm. parental care. So um, how do you envision that a credit could be used not only to support grandparent care as it exists, but also to support families who rely on grandparent care if that grandparent is no longer able to care for the child? Yeah, that's a great point on both. So I think to, to take the first piece of it, I think there are an, so an increasing number of uh, programs out there that are focusing on how do you sort of provide informal caregivers, these friend FFN caregivers, with just some baseline sort of A skills and, and B connection with other people who are doing this. Um, we know that obviously, you know, the grandparents are doing this out of love uh, and there's no question that they're going to have a warm relationship with the kid and that's the most important. But we also know that, you know, when you're older, like chasing after a, a toddler is not always easy. Um, and you may have been grown up in a generation that had a different view of child development. Um, you know, I, the, the sort of common example of, there was a time not that long ago where like the baby doesn't talk, why would I talk to the baby? And so it's like, that's, uh, so being able to do that and we see programs, I know um, there's, I think the best studied one in domestically is probably the, the Tutu and Me program in Hawaii. Um, there's a, one I profile on the book in New York City called the, the CARE, C-A-R-E program. And so uh, by providing sort of bringing friends and family neighbor care into a broader birth to five early care system, you, you suddenly both, again, you're honoring the work that they're doing, you're also accessing them into supports. Um, so that's that's one. I think the other, and this is not something I get into much in this book, but something that I would, would sort of uh, sort of hearken to. I think the work that um, I believe, I found, if I'm mispronouncing this, I apologize. Arjun Pu and sort of the whole work on sort of the universal family care. Um, we do need to reckon with the fact that on the other side of the age spectrum, we have an aging population um, in many cases that is not retiring with a whole lot of, of assets of their own, and therefore they're working longer. Right? That we know that we know that older. Uh, adults are, are sort of, you see the, the kind of archetypical Walmart reader who's, you know, 69 years old, right? Like that, that sort of stuff. And so putting them into the system where you're providing some income um, for doing this work, I think also reduces the stress level um, and provides a baseline um, for sort of more of a, of a multi-generational care. So one voice that um, it's it's often as an early childhood advocate, um, I, I somehow have very few connections to parents outside of parents who actually um, work in, in childcare or early education already. And I know that there are amazing groups like Moms Rising that are, you know, in Strolling Thunder that really um, get the parent voice out there in childcare. But in your book, um, you, you were able to talk to some parents. And how are you, I wanted to know how, what it was like to get to the, get those parents to talk about the really tough conversations we need to start having about the choices we make that we don't want to, I think there's a, a lot of times parents don't want to vocalize the fact that they, it, it's, it's too hard, you know, it's unfair. Yeah. They don't want to say that what they're being expected to do is just not something we should accept as the status quo. So yeah. how do you, how did you get parents to open up and share that with you? Yeah, uh, so it's interesting. Uh, I made sort of a decision early on in this book uh, when I started writing, conceptualizing of it, not to focus on uh, sort of lower and like parents who are at or near the poverty line, um, not because they're the ones who disproportionately suffer the most from this, but I also felt like there are lots of amazing journalism happening around those those families. One thing I wanted to focus on was was sort of middle class parents because feeling this personally and with many of my peers in these conversations, I realized this pain point has really reached into the middle class, in some cases into the upper middle class. Um, and so it, it, I was actually surprised by how much parents wanted to talk about this like it was like a dam was breaking when they so you started to ask them these questions and they were and you know because you're right it is so it's not something you sit around talking about um because there is a feeling of you know we're in our early 30s we're both college educated we're both employed we have you know one to two kids we live in you know maybe a relatively expensive urban area but still like we should be able to, to cut we've done it you know i, I talk about like and our American Enterprise Institute has this sort of millennial success sequence and, and almost every single parent um, or couple that I, I profile in the book has sort of completed it. This idea of they got the college education, they got jobs, they got married, right? They did everything in the order they're sort of supposed to do it and yet they're, they're struggling. 
badly. Um, and so seeing that when you start, start to ask you know, these questions, like tell me more about your situation, tell me more about like what it would mean to you if this was free. Um, and, and the answer is, you know, I think one of the most, um, you know, poignant uh, ones for, for me actually was I was in talking to a couple out in the San Francisco Bay Area making $150,000 a year, which even in the Bay, it's a lot, right? And, and they have, and the way that the, the, the father was talking about this, saying that, you know, being able to zero out the childcare expenses would finally feel like sort of the, the best raise of his life because that would be like financial independence. And like, I was like, that is, that's a couple making $150,000, even in the Bay, like I don't know, everyone else who's making less than that is dealing with everyone who's not you know in a two earner college educated family with you know all of the generational wealth and, and, and resources so um but i was really uh i was i was surprised a little bit to your point kitty about how open people were willing to be certainly when sort of this developed more into a book that was gonna get published if you i know i was going back over um with us like, can you please put a pseudonym in or you know can you please uh you know take out the identifying details because you know one family said to me like who had said to me we can't afford to have two kids in high quality childcare and we know that and we know that we're pulling them out and we're putting them into what we consider to be an inferior setting for our family finances and they were like I can't have our our child cannot grow up and then read that you know knowing with ours identified but that those sort of stories again like I come back to it like that that should not be happening in the American middle class. Um, and uh, that's a sign of just how badly broken um, early, early care is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Joe, do you, would you mind feeling the chat box a little bit for us? Certainly, yeah, we have a, we have a couple of questions coming in, Elliot. Um, the first is uh, related to the BA level teacher in multiple mm. settings. How does this work for expectations for early childhood educators in all settings? How can we incentivize educators to pursue more education, provide quality care when some local and state standards are so low? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. So, and, and I know there's been a lot of, of work done on this between the National Academy is transforming the workforce report and, and others. Uh, I think a couple of things, I, and the power of the profession for, from NACI as well being another sort of effort around this. Uh, so I think two things can be true at once. I think you can, simultaneously sort of raise uh, expectations for training uh, for teachers because there's more money going into the system, right? So if you're, it's, I've always thought that it is kind of a, uh, I would just say it is an, an unusual thing to be like, we're going to ask you to keep getting increasing amounts of, of you know, training, but we're not gonna really pay you any more money, right? Like, and so when you're making, you know, you know, between 12 and 20 dollars an hour and someone's asking you to go get a bachelor's degree like but they're not going to then up your pay to you know, making in the uh what we consider middle class wages that's that's a problem um so i think when you do have enough public money in the system you can start to make those expectations a little bit more reasonable my one concern about that though is again we go back to this idea that setting matters more than or that quality matters more than setting and so I do think we have to be a little bit careful, and this is a little out of the scope of the book specifically and more just any state or city that wanted to do a universal system would have to figure this out. How do you honor the fact that there are is a vibrant home, uh, family, child care, and home care system that has been doing this work for decades, most of whom are, to generalize, older women, just a very high percentage of women of color who have been sort of keeping the, the kind of child care system afloat in a lot of ways um, and then to say essentially like you need to go and get a bachelor's degree to keep doing this seems to me to be a, like a problematic or a point of tension that's going to have to be worked out i will say more broadly though when you have a lot of public money in the system suddenly you have a lot more flexibility in, in sort of what you're uh, expecting and also what you're what you're kind of requiring because you can again say we're expecting this because we're then going to be paying you, you know, $50,000 with benefits is a lot different than when you're paying you $11 an hour with no benefits. And if I could just piggyback on that. Yeah, the, the right now there's a huge, um, you know, attrition rate and also replacement rate issues. There's not, you know, many people my age, I'm 30, hopping into family childcare and not nearly enough to replace the people who are on the brink of retirement. So as we're talking about things like, you know, maybe incentivizing education in families, childcare spaces, 
the sooner this is seen as a path to a viable living wage where you'll have a flourishing life and that is, you know, makes it feel worth it, the, the better, you know, and then the better outcomes will be for children and the better outcomes will be for the, the people who are providing care or educating children themselves. And children are learning no matter where they are, no matter who is, you know, at, at the core of that. So making sure that, the, that you get the best possible outcomes is the key there. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we also have this other question about in, um, at home parents mm -hmm. and using the credit. What what would they need to do to be able to use the credit you propose? Yeah. So I see this as both at home parents and grandparents, and I think those it's important to distinguish those two. So I say in the book, like parents are always accredited to take care of their own kids. I, I don't think there can be any system where you require parents to to do something um, before that they're able to um, sort of access the payment. Uh, I think that again, you want to offer them all sorts of voluntary resources. You want to offer them free books. You want to offer them workshops. You want to offer them, you know, uh, play groups. You want to offer them. On parents night out, you want to offer them everything that you want, that you can, um, but I think there, it gets very, very slippery very, very quickly the moment you start saying the parents have to do anything for their own children uh, in order to, to sort of get compensated for paying their own children. Um, again, others can sort of disagree on that. That's kind of where I come down on it. Um, I think grandparents is a, is sort of a place where I think you could expect a lighter touch accreditation. Again, I don't think grandma is going back to get, you know, necessarily an associate's or a bachelor's degree in child development if she doesn't already have it. Um, but when you think about some of these programs like the Tutu and Me or the Care in New York, even even sort of a CDA level, um, it may be reasonable to to ask for for some sort of base level of training, um, and that would be compensated. And the other thing about the I think publicly funding a free universal birth to five system, which is the, the way I conceive of it, is no one's forcing anyone to do anything, right? If grandma is totally happy providing care for free, has no particular interest in, in accessing, you know, trainings, or that she's totally welcome to do that. No one's forcing anyone to do anything. Um, so this will only, but if, if the grandparent did want to get compensated via the, the sort of line of credit, I think that we, it's reasonable to expect that they would get um, a base level of training. Um, similarly for, for a nanny or an au pair or any of these sort of um, <coughs> FFN individualized caregivers. Great, yeah. And so there's, there's also a comment here from Catherine Myers about the assumption that um, among childhood educators that more education equals better care. Uh, not necessarily true. Ellie, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, it's a, it's a sticky subject. Um, and it's, again, a one where I, I will sort of comment broadly with, again, the caveat that uh, I think states with laboratories of democracy, and this is one of the places where it's going to work. And I think you're going to see some states probably uh, have less educational requirements and some have more. I, I do think that um, we do have a tendency in this country generally to conflate um, a degree with a level of competency. Um, I think we've seen this certainly. I, I initially started my career in the K-12 field. It's certainly true for, for a while there in the 80s and 90s. We like we want all of our teachers to have master's degrees in the subject that they're teaching at the K-12 level, and we're going to pay more for it. And then a bunch of studies came out that having a master's degree had literally no impact on student achievement or teacher quality. So uh, on the other hand, we do know what we know does matter is sort of, again, these competencies. So these specific and discrete skills and knowledges and, and abilities to uh, to put those into practice. And so um, I think a system of that where you're, again, providing key trainings, providing coaching, all, all of those um, things are absolutely good. But sometimes we do have a tendency to uh, to think of degrees, uh, sort of the signaling value of a degree versus what a degree actually means that, that a practitioner is able to, to do um, and what impact that will have on, on the child. Um, I don't know, Katie, what's, what's your thought on that? Um, it's hard because, well, first of all, you know, <laughs> I work with the New York Association right. for the Education of Young Children. Um, we're currently working through Power to the Profession, and that has come down firmly on the side that we need to be working towards bachelor's degrees at a minimum for anyone who considers himself an early childhood educator. Um, not everyone who provides child care will consider themselves an early childhood educator. Um, I think that that distinction for me personally creates um, bureaucracy stumbling blocks potentially for funding a system um, and it, it worries me a little bit as far as implementation goes. Um, I tend to 
my right now where I stand is that I can't support anything that forces people to get a higher education to remain in their jobs when there's not enough people doing these jobs when mm. centers are closing and when child care providers are living out of their cars <laughs> so yeah, that's a, um that's first, that's, first principles yeah those yeah. are that's where that's yeah. where i stand on it right yeah. now yeah yeah we also have a question here elliot um who are the political champions for this policy that, that you've sketched out yeah, um, that's a great question. I think this is going, so right now I will say this, the, the national conversation is is not here yet. Part of the reason I wrote this book is to try to shift the, the sort of have the conversation. I think uh, my read on this, and, and again, I have not saying this is 100% accurate, but my read on it is that the, the child, your early childhood field has for a very, very long time been extraordinarily neglected when it comes to public policy. It has been sort of like in the back corner of the back corner of, of children's issues versus like the behemoth that is K-12 education, um, particularly after the, the 1983 Nation at Risk. Um, and so I think we've gotten to a point where uh, people are thankfully paying attention. I am incredibly sort of heartened and gratified um, by the work at, that uh, advocates have been doing for a very long time to make that happen. And the fact that we now have every major Democratic presidential candidate um, you know, out with a, an early childhood plan. Um, we have, uh, you know, think of think of what you will, but we did have the, the you know, White House hosting a summit on child care and families issues last week. Like these things are, are happening, the conversations are happening and, and that didn't happen uh, by accident. And so, um, but I don't know that anyone has sort of been making a super strong push yet for let's stop talking about 7%, let's stop talking about affordable, let's start talking about universally free birth to five. Um, and so, uh, you know, some of you may have seen, I had an op-ed out in USA Today last week about this, how like, actually, there's more movement for, for universally free college than there is for universally free birth to five early, early care and education, which is a little bit bizarre to me because I think whatever you think about the free college idea, I actually think the case can be made much more robustly for the, the first five years um, for that. And so, um, you know, I think there are political champions out there for early childhood care and education, for sure. I think Senator Patty Murray and the Child Care and Families Act um, has been great. I think, you know, uh, you look at those, I think, you know, Senator Warren and, and uh, Secretary Castro were some of the first two out of the gate in terms of having bold plans. So I think there are people paying attention to these issues. Um, but where I come back to it is, I think this is going to be a state-led thing. I think there's going to be a state or a city out there that is going to be the first so through the gate to realize the opportunity that is posed by having universally free early care and education, the return on investment, both in the medium and long term for the kids, also in the short immediate term from uh, increased parental and maternal employment. Um, and I think there's going to be localities or states that start that. I think they're going to reap enormous benefits from it. And I think uh, we're going to start to see the train kind of leave the station um, on that. I, I don't know if federally uh, we're there yet. Uh, I would like to see that conversation shift there, but it may need to, we may need a proof of concept on the states. And you know that's been the way a lot of major social changes have happened in this country. So that's not a, it's a, it's a proven strategy. If I could hop in with a question, because it's been something I'm, I wanted to know your thoughts on. I yep. don't think you quite had the, the opportunity within the scope of the book to touch on it, but basically, First of all, you do an excellent job, I think, providing a really robust case for, you know, the business case, the, the case for the achievement gap, economic success of mothers, reducing toxic stress. Like there's there's a billion reasons to support this. Yeah. But and I think we can get people on board from a huge variety of stakeholders up until the point where we say this, <laughs> we actually want them to do something more than a piecemeal solution. Yeah. You know, that's, that's where it stops. Like, Oh, actually wait, hold on. That's, that's too much. I can't possibly commit. What about a, a $500 tax credit? Here you go. You know, yeah. <laughs> so how do you, how do you think we bridge that gap from getting people to being generally supportive to actually yeah. specifically supportive? Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think a couple of things are going to need to be in place. I think one is we need to start making the argument more often that there are times and there are policies where going bigger is actually the way that you get the change done rather than incremental. There are times when you need to move incrementally 
incrementally, no, no question. And I'm not saying this change would happen overnight, but there are times when saying, uh, you know, we're going, and I actually think we've seen this in like DC's universal pre-K, right? Like 2004, they were starting that, but they said we want every single four and three-year-old essentially in, in a pre-K setting. And, and within 10 years, they got there. Um, and so it took them 10 years, but they, uh, you know, they set that goal out rather than I think our goal is again. So I think part of it is finding a state or locality and convincing the leadership there to say our goal is that by 2030, we have a system of universal free, you know, birth to five care that is funded at a level that we're paying every practitioner, you know, middle class wage. Um, and that is leadership, right? It's going to be leadership. It's going to be finding that uh, county commissioner or mayor or governor um, who's willing to, to sort of stake, stake some of their political future on that. Um, and then I think it's going to be require some smart people thinking through what exactly do the funding mechanisms look like. Um, but again, you know, I think we have uh, some interesting opportunities in this particular moment as you know, the, the I mean, honestly, marijuana legalization is sort of spreading the nation. That's a huge source of revenue. Colorado gets about $300 million a year off of that. Um, you know, I, I think uh, it's, I, I, you know, I've suffered this a little bit. I, I often hear business leaders getting up there in front of rooms and talking about how much that they care about early childhood education. And I, and I believe that they're earnest about that, but I also think it would be interesting to see them out there calling for a voluntary, you know, corporate tax increase. Um, with everything, I think we can make an argument uh, that, uh, you know, when we talk about carbon taxes and uh, the like, greenhouse gas trading systems, which raise a significant revenue for states is actually something that a part of that should be dedicated to children's services because children are the ones who are gonna suffer the most from the impact of climate change. Uh, so I think part of it is also getting past that question, Katie, of which uh, the thing I wrote my Medium post about, like, how are we going to pay for it? Because right, I think that's where people get to, right? They're like, okay, cool. I'm on board. That sounds good. That sounds like it's going to be expensive. And how do we pay for it? And then I sort of yeah, argue that's yeah. the that's the wrong question. It's not, it's not how are we going to pay for it. It's, uh, it's can we afford it? Yes. And, and what mechanisms are we going to use to, right. to you know, re to fill the, the needed funding? Right. So. And of, of course, can we afford not to? <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Question. Yes. Yeah. All right, Joe, what we got? Yeah, we have some others coming in here. Um, flexibility is a great aspect of a child development credit uh, for families, but curious uh, if it'll do enough to address childcare supply and work for force compensation or does this is a separate approach needed to address those issues yeah so i think when you put uh that amount of money in the hands of families uh, based on the patterns that we're seeing already i actually think you are going to have enough people flocking into the the sort of center-based and and family child care systems that we're going to be able to get compensation up so i don't anticipate i don't see this as a replacement for our current system so I think a lot of the people who use, for example, their state pre-K systems are perfectly happy with those slots. They use a Head Start slot um, who are in a center. And so this wouldn't uh, say, stop doing this. This would say, right now, you know, a state like Virginia, my state, our, our state pre-K is funded at roughly $6,000 a kid. And so if suddenly they were starting to be funded at $15,000 a kid, the amount of money you can offer in compensation spikes way up. Um, so I think that the, and similarly, I think the having suddenly the purchasing power um, and the interest and demand of parents should, you know, drive a marketplace. And we can talk about the, the specifics of what that marketplace should look like, but I think there's no question that right now, as we're seeing supply decline in the face of enormous demand, we have a failed market. And basically, you know, I'm not an economics expert, but I do you know from reading what most economic economists say is that when you have a failed market, it requires some sort of correction through public money usually to, to make it work. So, um, so yeah, so I, I think that um, supercharging sort of the system with a whole bunch of money, and I'm talking, this is going to be in the hundreds of billions of dollars nationally every year. And that sounds like a big number. It's also absolutely what we need. Um, you know, we, we pay about, we spend about $700 billion every year on K-12 education um, in this country. And we spend we total everything up significantly less than 100 billion um, on, on the first five years of life, which you know are only the, the most important for child development. Uh, so I think 
you know, when we get that level of money in the system, I, and again, this is what Katie was talking about, instead of kind of these half measures or instead of these sort of modest increases, that's what lets us reinvention the system. And we do need to re-envision the system, it's, you know, and we're not going to get there um, until we have enough money in the system to, to do it. Ellie, so can I follow have. up on follow up on Please. that? Just to just something that's been bothering me recently. Yeah, uh, I think you're absolutely right about the role of government here. And and one role that the government played during the Great Depression was stimulating was in stimulating the development of workers cooperatives. Mm -hmm. um, and there there's a lot of parent co-op child care yes. out there, but I'm I'm not familiar with a whole lot of worker-owned cooperatives mm. uh, in childcare, and there's, you know, there, there, there. That's a pathway. More economic democracy is a pathway to addressing some of these workforce issues. I'm just curious if you've come across any of that. Yeah, um, I think that it's not something I personally support or very familiar with either. But I think you're absolutely right, and I think that, um, you know, Joe, we we talk about this some like this when you start to have a, a adequately funded system, it opens the opportunity for so many more types of care to sprout up. So yeah, workers are collaboratives, like let's do it. Like, you know, I, I know in places like Finland, they have these sort of open centers, which is sort of a basically a municipal building where, where you know, informal caregivers, these home family care providers can go um, and have a place to, that's sort of outfitted for kids, right? There, there are all sorts of um, these opportunities. So uh, I can't say I specifically looked into that question, but but generally, yes. Like I think when we do have more money in the system, we should be able to explore that. I think we need to think about things like, um, you know, more broad opportunities for unionizing, you know, childcare workers. All all of these things we want in a healthy functioning uh, sector, which is currently sort of on, on not not in place, and it's part of the reason the sector is so unhealthy. Great. We also have a question here, Elliot, about uh, do we need paid family leave first? Does mm -hmm. one need to come before the other? I, I think it's a both and. I don't think it's a, it's a um, first then. So I think um, we absolutely need paid family leave. I think um, we absolutely need some kind of child allowance, um, you know, which I thought another question about that. Um, and I think we need free uh, universal birth to five child care. So um, I don't think they have to be competing priorities, and I actually think they're stronger when you talk about this. Is you know, uh, to, to, to get your point, kind of the family fun pack that, that the People's Policy Project did. I thought that's one thing they did well as they talked about this is a is a suite of things when you talk, you know, and I was talking about children's health care, right? You know, there are still children out there that aren't you know being covered or whose whose health care is incredibly expensive, and that's another hit on the family budget. So um, I think it's broadly thinking about. Uh, what does the experience of a family look like from sort of the moment that the, they're, they're pregnant to the, the, the moment they're entering sort of our public education system and what do we need every step of the way? And we even, another thing we haven't talked about much uh, is home, home visiting programs, things like that. I think all, all of that needs to be wrapped into this. None of it happens if you don't start by saying the first five years of life are a public good, that, that the public has a, a inherent interest in making sure that we are providing enough funding um, to, to support for parents and, and kids through every step of that way. Um, and so uh, I think, yes, and. Yeah, and then a question here about how this would work for families with two or three children. Uh, those who cho choose child care centers, would the child care credit for each, would they get, I think, would they get the child care credit for each mm -hmm. child? And could an at-home parent also claim the credit for each child? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, and some of that gets sort of down to that level of like, uh, I don't want sort of the details of what I'm specifically, what I, what I choose to propose in the book being sort of an impediment to the broader conversation um, of whether it should be universal free, um, you know, with hundreds of billions of dollars of public investment. Um, I, I think to answer the specific question though, most Northern European nations have some form of cash opt out for their stay at home parents um, if you choose not to access their, their publicly subsidized childcare. Um, and that tends to be, um, though the structure of those tend to be that you get kind of a one level, so the base level for the first child, and then it reduces sort of for, for children thereafter. Um, so, and it, but I do think, again, the mixed ability of this is, is any way well, you need a scheme that can be um, flexible because yes, there, there are going to be times when um, one child is going to be home or the child is going to be in the center. It's going to be times when uh, a parent wants to, again, uh, work part-time and have, have their um, child instead of part-time. We, we need all of those, those sort of ability for parents to matrix and the, the flexibility that works for 
whatever they want and need, honoring again the parental prerogative and the parental preference, putting that at the center, uh, putting the family at the center. I think letting the policy design emanate from that. So just kind of a, a question to get everyone thinking about how we can look towards both the, the lessons of the past, but also what we can do in the future. So my personal example is um, my mom left her job in 1990 because her retail management um, pay didn't cover the cost of childcare, and my grandmother was in her 70s already by that point and was much too old to care for me. Um, she just wasn't capable. Um, so this isn't a new problem. We know it was it reached a peak in the 70s with you know wages for domestic work, and we know that post World War II there was a huge battle to keep centers open that were open during World War II. So what makes you confident or optimistic that this time it can be different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the reason, my main reason for optimism is kind of a sad one, but it's honestly true, like, it, the pain point is broad enough now, I think that it's hard to, it's beyond hard to ignore it. So, we are at a time now when, again, two-thirds of kids, all, all parents are in the household, middle class, upper middle class families are suffering from this. This is a problem for parents with one earner families, with stay-at-home parents are struggling financially because it doesn't help with the cost of healthcare and housing and all the rest of it. Um, so everywhere you look, red state and blue, or, or you know, rural and urban, there is struggle. And then generally what we've seen, oh, and the third piece of this is also businesses realizing, oh, hey, we have a problem. We have a problem because uh, we're losing productivity. We have a problem because we're losing workers, right? Like in one of the tightest labor markets in, in you know, recent history, the fact that, you know, CAP estimates one to two million workers who would like to be in the workforce are, are not because of childcare issues. Um, you know, and I think that's another, so we've got, it's pain points in the middle class, it's, it hits a geographically, um, and, you know, and politically diverse set of people and businesses on board, like that has historically been the, the sort of cocktail that you need for significant change. Um, so that's what gives me a uh, sort of hope we're at a moment that we can make this shift. Um, I think it's going though, it's not going to happen on its own. I mean, I think the trajectory we are currently on is going to continue to see sort of modest uh, steps. And then again, I don't want, I don't say that in any way disparagingly because even these modest steps against the backdrop of what families and, and providers and practitioners are suffering on right now is still a huge improvement. Um, but we do, I feel like the inches that have been fought to get us to this place give us the opportunity to, to look ahead and start leaping by miles. And so that's really like, that's the conversation I think we need to start having is, um, you know, and, and I had a, you know, a conversation just the other um, week as one of the people on this call, Bill Hudson, Family Child Care says, used to run the National Family Child Care Association. And we were talking about, um, it's interesting because we actually also have an opportunity to re-envision a system from birth forward. A lot of the conversation right now is really how do we take this sort of antiquated 150 year old you know, public education system um, with all of its great things and all of its warts and all of it and then sort of march it backwards um, a couple of years. Or do we start to say, actually, that's not how child development works. That's not what parents want or need um, all the time. And, and we have a chance to say like, what does it actually mean if a blank slate, blank piece of paper, um, because, uh, when you have such a broken system, right, we're not trying, the problem with education reform on some level is that you have 50 million children in public, in 100,000 public schools, in 40,000 school districts around this country. And so that is a giant battleship to try to, to turn in any direction. Your early care education is due to very sort of deliberate disinvestment over the decades. It, it is in, uh, it is disconnected. The kids are everywhere. There is no system. I, you know, I don't know who first started calling it a non-system, but I've certainly adopted that language because it isn't. It's like not even fair to call it a system. Um, and while states and Abby's been doing, have been doing really sort of hard, hard work of trying to build some infrastructure between QRISs, which didn't exist before the nine these and now part of the profession of various other things, um, we do have sort of an opportunity where there isn't a whole lot there there yet at the moment. And so we can start to think about it again. And I, and I want us to have those conversations. Um, you know, I want us to look at international examples. Uh, you know, Joe talks about this a lot, which I appreciate because I'll often say, wow, like Finland's doing this awesome thing or, you know, this is amazing thing happening in Israel or so. And he's like, well, some, there's, in some ways, those countries had 
previous conversations about what do you even want to get out of childhood? What is even the goal? Um, and, you know, I, I think I, I come back to and I talk about in the book that the Dutch have, have a the Dutch government's belief in, in what early, their purpose or their uh, obligation in early childhood is to provide the best possible conditions for families with children. And that's the mission statement. And I feel like in a lot of ways, early childhood for us as the mission statement has become get kids ready for kindergarten. And those are two exceptionally different mission statements. And they lead you down exceptionally different paths. And I'm not saying there's all good in one, there's all good and bad, because there's a lot of good stuff that is happening. And there are, I mean, I hats off every single day to the hardworking early childhood educators in this country. Um, but it, it, that conversation about what does it mean if we were starting over essentially and redesigning the system with what we know now about child development, what we know now about families, what we know now about also what we're going into over the next you know decade of, of changes as a nation and as a society, um, I think that's going to, to lead us to design a different system. So if we're about to pump a couple hundred billion dollars into this system, I would, you know, over the next decade or two, like let's make sure that we're doing it right. For sure. Um, so just to kind of wrap up a little bit, what are you looking to in the future to expand on this work in, in your book or what kind of things will you be pivoting to that might be a little bit different? Yeah, uh, well, so first I want to keep talking about this because I think this conversation needs to, to have and I'd like to get, you know, yes. I, I always say this isn't, uh, this is not a vanity exercise for me in the sense that I want to talk to anyone and everyone about this because I think we need to start thinking about it in a different way. Um, I am interested in sort of two other main topics. One is sort of broadly asking this question about um, the role of, of sort of the stress and strain of modern life on the family, the relentlessness of not only sort of the, how we've broken the nine to five, sort of Monday to Wednesday work week model, but also the relentlessness of social media, the relentlessness of the expectations that were put, you know, I mean, Claire K. Miller had that article a few years back, the relentlessness of modern parenting, which is, as a modern parent, a, a pretty good description of, of what the, the days are like. And so I think there's more to explore there about what that means for, for a generation, the parents uh, you ex existing under that level of stress um, and for what it means for our children. Um, the other piece is, I, I often come back to climate change and its impact on the next generation. Um, and the fact that, you know, I think as parents, particularly as young parents of young children, um, and as those working with young children as a sector, we have something to say about that. I don't know the voice has been as, as loud as it could be. Um, so, so those are sort of two things uh, that I've been thinking about, but um, mostly excited to keep uh, kind of vetting these ideas, hearing what other people think, you know, it, you're right when you said this is not sort of a, a detailed policy. This is, this is a, a blueprint. This is a sort of, uh, discussion uh, a discussion starter and I'm excited to see kind of where those discussions go. Okay. Joe, yeah Joe do you yes. want to hop in? Great well I'll start to wrap us up. Thank you so much Elliot and Katie for your time and for this really enlightening conversation and also Elliot thank you for writing the book. Um, it, it's really stirred a, a, a whole different conversation, I think, on, on child care and the need for child care to be universal and supportive of parents in all sorts of different settings. So thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for continuing to push us into the future. Um, one thing I would just mention, uh, you all referenced earlier our work with uh, KnowledgeWorks, the Foundations for Flourishing, for Flourishing Futures, uh, paper forecast, uh, tenure forecast, looking at many of these issues, that is available at the KnowledgeWorks website, and I included a link in the chat box, which we will leave up and also include in our follow-up email. If you haven't read that, I, I'd encourage you all uh, to read it. I think our, our KnowledgeWorks colleagues did a fantastic job with their strategic foresight team at looking at, at many of these trends that we've talked about today, and it has really led us to a place of uh, recognition that we need to think beyond the existing early childhood system to under, understand and to advocate around all these issues, whether it be climate change or economic security, uh, that really impact uh, young children and their families and are really driving that relentlessness that um, Elliot, you, as you reminded us, Claire Kane Miller 
uh, focused on several years ago in that piece. So um, thank you all very much for joining us today. Thanks again, Elliot and Katie. Uh, and we will be in touch with you uh, sharing a link uh, to this, uh, if you'd like to share it with others, uh, to the recording of this, sharing a link to the forecast and, and more information about that. Uh, and also um, opportunities for further conversation on these very important topics. Have a great Thank afternoon, you. everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Thank you, everyone. everyone.